Well, so yeah, so we are really happy to have uh, Simon Hong with us today. He's an assistant professor at uh, Oregon State University, and he works on uh, computer security and privacy and machine learning. So this is uh, you know a, a talk at the intersection of what Trust Lab does as well as what uh, our colleagues at Siemens does do. So I, I'll, I'll uh, uh, maybe uh, yeah. So he has won several awards and. Uh, he's a DARPA Riser 2022 and a Yusin speaker at uh, uh, 2020, in 2021. Um, so I'll let, uh, let uh, uh, Simon take over. Yeah, sure. So thank you, Professor Manoj. Uh, uh, yeah, we can, we can begin the talk formally now. Okay. All right. Um, thank you again. Uh, Manoj and also Muko. Um, I am, it's my honor to be here and thanks for everyone coming to my talk again. And as Manoj explained, um, I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Oregon State University. And my long term career goal is to build secure and reliable deep learning systems from a system security perspective, which I explain it later. And today I'm very excited to share some of my work uh, toward this goal with you all and hopefully end of this talk. I hope that um, some of the interested students can also, you know, to come to Oregon State and pursue my dream and our dream again uh, together. So certainly deep learning is a thing. For instance, in the image classification benchmark, we see a deep learning has started performing better than humans from 2015. And the US government emphasized the importance of the AI in the future. And moreover, the number of papers we are submitting and submitted in major machine learning conferences such as NeurIPS and iClear are increasing exponentially. And we're now facing emerging safety critical systems that include a neural network as a key component. So Tesla released the first autopilot in 2015 and people have been working on AI assisted robotic surgery and US airport employ AI based surveillance systems and recently, Neuralink demonstrated that uh, their chip embedded in the monkey's brain enables the monkey to play a ping pong by only using her mind. That's amazing. Um, so to assure our safety, security, and privacy while using those emerging systems, the first step is to understand their worst case scenarios. So the security and the machine learning communities indeed acknowledge this problem and study the failure mode of deep learning systems. Their focus is to identify properties of the neural networks that can lead to the critical security threat. First, they studied the adversary examples showing that networks predictions are sensitive to small input changes. And I know that probably everyone heard about this panda, which is the, you know, the world famous panda in the world. Uh, another example is the data poisoning attacks. Unlike the conventional software like Microsoft PowerPoint that I'm using right now, network learn correct behaviors from their training data outside their system, which means that if a hacker can inject malicious samples into the training data, they can control the behaviors of the deep learning systems. For example, an AI chapel learned from the bad tweets became a racist really quickly. And your self-driving car trained on the malicious data can recognize the stop signs as a speed limit and then cause a crash. So right now, it's encouraging that the community started thinking about these problems. But let's take a moment, step back, and look at this entire feature from the holistic view. So despite all this prior work's effort, most studies consider neural networks as an isolated mathematical concept. Here I illustrate this problem. If there is a network and the prior work concerns input manipulations and expect the incorrect predictions. But what we are really missing right now in reality, when we deploy network to the real world systems, require many other components such as hardware, software, communication network, or even humans who operate your deep learning systems. And each of those components is equally subject to adversarial pressure. And there could be a vulnerable interplay between those components and the deep learning uh, system, uh, deep neural networks, excuse me. So in the real world, we indeed uh, need a system security perspective to build a secure and reliable deep learning systems. So therefore, my research is to building trustworthy and socially responsible deep learning systems from this system security perspective. And I don't 
only look at these deep learning models as a mathematical concept, but also look at them as a computational component interacting with other components. So me and my students are working on first practical hardware attacks on deep learning models or attacks that exploit novel deep learning algorithms designed for sustainability or efficiency and the security and the privacy problems that is the traditional problems of deep learning models or security problems caused by the way we commonly deploy deep learning models to the devices or using those secure models to build and solve other security problems. So today I'd like to talk about how hardware attacks can break the integrity of deep learning models and how an attacker can jeopardize the efficiency of deep learning models and how an adversary can exploit, exploit a common practice of deploying those models for malicious purposes. And let's first see how hardware attacks can make a model useless. So here's an interesting paper in 1990, Dr. Jan Lekun, the father of the deep learning, uh, who's also a professor in New York University, published this seminar paper titled Optimal Brain Damage. This is the first work that reported the graceful degradation property, showing that you can remove 60% of model parameters without any access drop. So researchers right after that came up with a bunch of techniques based on this intuition. For example, they try to prune the network to reduce the inference cost. They do quantization to compress the network size, and they even add a noise to parameters to improve the robustness against adversary examples. And all these techniques claim their benefits with no accurate drop. So prior work in security also examined whether it is really hard to degrade the accuracy. They did poisoning attacks, cause a lot of random bitwise errors to storage media where the networks are stored, or cause a hardware level fault randomly, but they all showed that on average, it's difficult to pull the accuracy of a network more than 10%. However, all this resilience can give you a false sense of security because they focused on the best case scenarios or the average case perturbations, not the worst case one. So let me illustrate what it means from this diagram. Here we have a standard four layer convolutional neural network that has two convolutional layers and two fully connected layers trained on MNIST. The network has model parameters described as blue boxes, optimized in training and used in inferences to classify data correctly. Of course, it has an accuracy of 99%. So this illustration shows the best case graceful degradation. You first can find the parameters that do not cause any accuracy drop and safely remove them. Of course, after that, the accuracy will be intact uh, after this perturbation. So let's also look at the how prior work in security examined this resilience. To understand their work, I first illustrated a deep neural network's memory representation. So on the below, you see model parameters such as weight and biases I loaded into memory. And prior work randomly causes a bitwise errors and measure the average accuracy drop. For example, they randomly flip five bits in the last layer and measure the average damage to a system. Of course, the accuracy drop on average is pretty small, within 5%. But this wasn't quite convincing to me at the time because first, you may ignore the large accuracy drop because you average them up. And second, there is always the case where you just flip insignificant bits. So in this example, if you flip a bit in the mantisa, the change of the parameter value in a system is small from 0.4 to 0.5 which is a negligible impact on the model's accuracy. However, for the same parameter, if you flip the most significant bit, MSB, in the exponent uh, from zero to one, you can change the parameter value exponentially, showing the definition of a small perturbation in systems perspective can be very different from a numerical standpoint. And the bit flip inflicts the accuracy drop of 41%, which is a grisly degradation. So now the challenge is how to evaluate this vulnerability of the neural network to this single bit flip errors. So here's my method, which is um, very simple. I take a model, flip each bit in all parameters of the model uh, from zero to one, one or one to zero, and measure the accuracy drop over the test set uh, to each bit flip and mark Achilles bits. The Achilles bit is that once we flip that bit, it can lead to the accuracy drop over 10%. 
And the reason why I set 10% as the baseline is 10% was the challenge claimed by the prior work in security. They said that if you try to compromise the model, pulling the model's accuracy more than 10% is really hard. So then I quantify the vulnerability. First, I look at how much damage a bit flip can inflict, which is the maximum accuracy drop. And second, I look at how many parameters contain at least one Achilles bit, which means how many single point of failure a deep neural network has. So I started by examining the MNIST model, which is one-on-one -on -one models in deep neural network uh, with the different architectures and training configurations. And I found that in all eight models, there is at least one bit that causes the accuracy drop of a model more than 98% once the bit is flipped. So maximum damage will be close to 100%. And I also checked that how many parameters contain at least one Achilles bit. And approximately half of the parameters that we examine contain at least one bit and can push the accuracy drop below the prior work's lower bound, 10%. So I scaled up our experiment by examining 11 larger models and a high head of consistent result. Flipping one bit can make a model worse than random, and half of the model parameters contain a killer bit, which means that the vulnerability of neural networks to a single bit flip is prevalent. So now my research question becomes, how can an adversary exploit this prevalent vulnerability? So this is an interesting part. So to answer this question in security, we, we talk about the threat model. So here I designed the threat model of the bit flip attacker. If the attacker can control the bit flip location in memory, the attacker is strong, but if the attacker is not, it's an inaccurate attacker. And in terms of the knowledge, the white box attacker has the full visibility of the model parameters, and they know which parameters are vulnerable, whereas the black box attacker doesn't have that knowledge. They just randomly flip the bits in the memory. So here I illustrate the space of the single bit adversary the vertical axis indicate the capability of the attacker and the horizontal axis means the attacker's knowledge. And the stronger attacker is in the upper right quadrant who knows which bit to flip in a model and can flip only that bit. And this attacker can control the accuracy drop uh, with a bit flip from zero to 100%. And the, on the opposite side, there is the weakest attacker who doesn't know which bit to flip and cannot control the bit flip locations so the probability of causing a significant accuracy drop in this case is really, really small. However, suppose that the weakest attacker flips the multiple bits and the probability of hitting an Achilles bit increases because half of the model's parameters contain at least one Achilles bit. Therefore, the weakest attacker can become a strong attacker. So we evaluate this vulnerability against the real world hardware attacks. So I provide a practical weapon to this weakest attacker, which is Roll Hammer, who can flip bits in memory at the software level. So to illustrate the Roll Hammer attacks, I have DRAM on the left, and DRAMs are composed of the multiple DRAM bank, which is the small uh, black uh, square on the diagram. So the rows in DRAM banks uh, store the data, and when the victim accesses this data, the role is activated and the data will be sent to CPU side. The attacker to compromise the victim's data accesses the data in the nearby rows multiple times. Just reading those rows is sufficient for causing the error. And performing this leaks the capacitor charges in the middle row, which is uh, denoted as a blue, and causes a bit flip in the victim's data. And also um, this row hammer attack is actually exploited in the cross VM scenarios. So where uh, attacker can share the memory with the other VMs. And in this case, attacker can give the row hammer pressure to the memory so that at some location in the victim's VM's memory can be actually uh, caused by, uh, can have a bit flip uh, in the end. So I evaluate this attack in a practical deployment scenario where First, a victim runs off the off the shelf image and models in a VM, and the attacker runs another VM and randomly tries to flip it in the victim's memory. So there are necessarily two VMs, and the attacker's VM tries to give a pressure to the memory that is shared with the victim's VM. And then victim, when they allocate the deep neural networks to one of those locations, and the bit flip occurs to the uh, neural network memory. 
So I run this attack multiple times on a different DRAM chips to estimate the exploitability in the real world. And I'm skipping all these experimental details due to the lack of time. But if you're curious, you can uh, read uh, my paper, refer to my paper. So we found that this weakest roll hammer attacker can inflict the severe damage. So on average, 60%, 62% of the attacks cause the accuracy drop over 10%. And the time it takes to cause the accuracy drop is less than a few minutes. And also our attacker is difficult to detect. In only 0.08% of all the experimental cases, the attacker caused the program crashes. And in most cases, victim will not know whether they are under attack. The attacker just drink a cup of coffee. And then after a few row hammer attacks, um, the deep neural network accuracy is you know, horrible in the end. So what this means, here is a takeaway message. I show that the neural networks are particularly vulnerable to fault attacks. So if we consider a uh, traditional software like Microsoft Word, it's not vulnerable to the random bit flip. The attacker requires a precise bit flip in this case. One, in the address space layout, there aren't many vulnerable bits in the Microsoft uh, Word that is running in the memory. And therefore, the random bit flip are difficult to trigger the vulnerability. And they are also likely to cause uh, program crashes then the victim will just you know, restart the program and there will be no bit flip at all. So the random bit flip has been considered an ineffective attack in prior work. However, in a case of deep neural networks, it occupies more memory space than the instructions required to run it. And moreover, 50% of the model parameters in these locations are vulnerable. So this attacker does not need a precise bit flip. Even with the random bit flips, the attacker can inflict the accuracy drop over 10% easily, and there will be no visible program crashes, so it is not easy for a defender to detect our attack. So this is the first one that I wanted to introduce. And before we continue, I'll make a pause around the five minutes at here, and happy to have any questions for the first one. Any yeah, we, uh, no, don't see any questions, so uh, probably we can continue. Mm -hmm. Sure, I can continue. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please, you know, the ask sure. at the end of the talk. All right, now we've seen hardware attacks can push the deep learning models to the boundaries we never visited, right? Let's then talk about uh, how vulnerable our deep learning algorithms designed for reducing computational cost. So computational efficiency is a growing concern in deep learning. So as we can see in this uh, left figure, you should read it from right to left. The error rate on the popular image classification benchmark ImageNet has been decreasing. And behind this, all this advancement, we have a network with more layers. And a recent article from Harvard warned that training a network can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetimes. So me and my colleagues studies why deeper networks are computationally expensive. And we found the overthinking problem. A network uses the same amount of computation for every single input that is unnecessary for the simple inputs. So if you see the simple lemon on the left side, a shallow network with two layers are just enough to make a correct classification. So to address this problem, uh, we propose this multi-exit architectures. And, and those architectures have multiple side branches, which is called the early access, where we can preemptively stop forward propagations. And the key idea behind this mechanism is the input adaptive inference. So simple inputs consisting of 80% of uh, CIFAR10 images can be correctly classified at the early axis. Maybe using one convolution layer is just enough to make a correct classification. But complex inputs will be processed by deeper layers and the networks makes correct classifications on that. So harnessing this input adaptive mechanisms, multi-exit networks save the computations by 50% uh, while preserving their accuracy. So because of such benefits, multi models receive attention from the community in natural language processing domain where we stack a lot of fully connected decoders, uh, which is 
you know, complex and large birth models, uses multi-action mechanisms to enable faster and efficient inferences. And besides, prior work also partitioned the multi-action networks to bring deeper and complex networks to IoT devices. So let me uh, try to explain what it means. So previously, IoT devices need to send all the inputs to the cloud to have the predictions uh, from a large network, which introduces the network uh, latency. But if we partition multi-exit network, deploy the shallow version to IoT devices and the rest and deeper networks to the cloud, they have the latency benefit as complex inputs will only be sent to the cloud and most of the simple inputs will be classified in the IoT devices. However, no one looked at such benefits from the multi -ex benefits of multi-exit models from a security perspective. So my intuition was that the benefits rely on inputs, and we know that the neural networks are sensitive to small input perturbations, which is adversary examples. So then we asked this research question, are the computational savings provided by these input adaptive mechanisms robust against the adversary input perturbations? If an attacker can craft the adversary examples that bypass all the early exits, then the system's benefit from this emerging architecture could be just dev slash nerf. So in this work, I propose a new threat model, slow down attacks, that an adversary jeopardizes the computational efficiency of the neural network. And since this is the first work on proposing this threat model, I provided the tools to the community to study this vulnerability systematically. The reason is that if I just want to provide a tools for um, just provide an attack for systems researchers, it's not going to be helpful and it's not used. And I want to provide a tools that actually use multi um, tools for systems researchers who use multi exit fault models for their um, systems to examine this vulnerability easily. So I first present a deep loss, a novel attack that cracked the adversary examples that bypass all the early exits. And I proposed a metric called the efficacy, a standardized metric to compare the impact of this attack across the different data sets, different architectures, and different mechanisms. So I'll illustrate the design of the deep loss. I first look at how multi-exit models make classification on each early exit. So those models use a pre-trained treasure T, which is the confidence based to stop forward propagations. For example, at one of the early exits, um, if the prediction confidence of a panda is higher than the threshold T, the network stops computation at that early exit and returns a prediction A panda. And I examined what we just um, use existing adversary samples like PGD just to see that uh, naive adversary examples actually cause a slowdown or not. Here I'm skipping all the details of the PGD attack for the lack of time, but I provided a visual explanation how it works and hope it works. Um, the attack has the objective of crafting perturbation for misclassifications, meaning the resulting perturbation increases the prediction confidence of any other classes than a panda. So if you're thinking about it in a multi exit models, it makes multi exit models classify them incorrectly in the earlier exit points rather than bypassing the exits. So this doesn't uh, fit with the attack objective we are trying to achieve. So I made a crafting objective slightly different. I pushed the adversary samples toward the uniform distribution over the class labels. Then the classification confidence of our deep slot samples become lower than the predefined threshold T at any of the exit point, which will make the panda bypass that exit point. But the previous modification concerns the only one axis. Therefore, I update the objective to consider all the exit points together then the perturbation to a panda will make the confidence in all exits below the threshold T. And in the end, the adversary sample is no longer panda. It becomes the sloth that causes a slowdown on multi-exit models. Excellent. So I also designed the efficacy metric to measure the impact of this attack. The metric is the area under the early exit capacity curve. So this curve is a cumulative plot I showed on the left side. It indicates that with a specific fraction of the models for inference cost, which is in the x-axis, how many test time samples will be classified by a model? So for example, if the curve is for the VGG16 um, SDN model, which is our shallow deep network modification, 
this red point indicated that within 40% of the entire computation, 90% of test time samples can be classified. It doesn't mean that it will be classified correctly, but 90% of test time samples will get a, a, a classification um, by using only 40% of the computation. Then this area under this curve um, becomes a standardized metric. So the efficacy will be one if all the model is, uh, is if the model is extremely efficient, but the metric will be zero if the network uses a full computation for all the inputs. And using this standardized metric, we can compare the efficacy across the different multi-exit mechanisms. So if you think about this um, area under the curve, is the score between zero and one. And in any models, any mechanisms, any data sets, we can get the score between zero and one. So then you can compare how much our attack is effective against the, um, other multi-exit mechanisms, for example, or the same mechanism trained for the other data set. So in evaluation, we use the two popular image classification benchmark and two different multi-exit mechanisms is in community, which is the shallow dim network and the MSDNet. And we first examine the scenarios where an attacker craft each individual samples. And in this case, the attacker can completely offset computation and savings by making the efficacy of multi exit models to zero. And in addition to that, uh, the attacker can cause the accuracy drop from four to 99%, which means sometimes if you use these multi exit models, you will use full computations and then get the bad result, which is really bad. And I also examine an interesting scenario where an adversary crafts the single perturbation and use them to cause indefinite slowdown for multiple samples. So you can imagine uh, a surveillance camera that is equipped with a partitioned shallow dim network. And then what we are trying to do, we printed out the perturbations in a thin a transparent film and then attach it to the camera. And then whenever you use this camera, like there will be network latency caused by the um, deep source attack. So in this case, they can also reduce the efficacy of the victim models by half and most. And moreover, our adversary example is transportable, meaning security by off security wouldn't work. So adversary who does not know the victim's architecture or the victim's training data, or any other input adaptive mechanisms that the victim uses, we can cause uh, other models to craft uh, adversary examples and attack the victim models, which is different from the models that we use for crafting. We also examined the impact of the deep flows in the real world systems. We conducted a case study on IoT deployment scenario, which we mentioned um, previously and show that deep slows can increase the latency expectations of an IoT network. So first of all, I partitioned the MSD net and deployed the first early exit to the AG device and the rest uh, to the AWS cloud. So this partitioning indeed reduces the network latency. Without partitioning, uh, I, an IoT device will send every impulse to the cloud, which takes 11 milliseconds on average until the edge receives the prediction from the cloud. But if we deploy the first partition to the edge, this can process the simple inputs and the latency becomes 0.5 milliseconds on average, which is 20 times less. But these loss we can see in the previous slide can convert the simple inputs to the complex inputs and force the edge device to send all the inputs to the cloud. Then the latency benefit will become a zero and the attacker can push the victim outside the system's uh, latency expectation, which we can cause the denial of service attack if we use this um, efficient deployment scenario in the IoT. And it's gonna be a really interesting scenario because um, US government is trying to um, pursue the sustainable deep learning, which tries to reduce the computational, um, it, it increase the computational efficiency, excuse me, or like reduce the computation itself uh, by using some novel mechanisms. And our research shows that, oh, oh no, hold on. Um, this is not the case. Probably there will be an easy attack the attacker can do. So bottom line of my, my work is deep neural networks are more vulnerable to complexity effects um, that reduce the computation and efficiency. So in the traditional software with efficient algorithms like hash table, 
the algorithm's complexity between average and the worst case is relatively not large. And the number of worst case input is few, so which makes the, you know, the um, hash collisions, uh, the small number of inputs that cause hash collisions. However, in the deep neural network system, the complexity difference will be large based on the design of the neural network architecture. And also there are many worst case inputs you have seen in the adversary examples um, that makes the neural networks are sensitive to, you know, the, um, these perturbations. And now I'm going to, yeah, so perturbations. So which is the significant difference. So this is the summary of the second work. And uh, uh, now I'm going to go ahead and discuss about my, you know, the final work. And um, I'll definitely leave more questions at the end of my talk. So the final pieces that I like to talk about is how an adversary can exploit a common practice of deploying models for malicious purposes. So we have seen that deep networks are computationally expensive. So here is some numbers. So training an efficient net on image net uh, classification benchmark take six days with many, many uh, tens of processing units developed by Google. And deploying large language models like BERT takes up one gigabyte of memory. And even with the GPU, the inference of a single input takes three seconds. So here another leading practices for reducing the size and the computation of the neural network is, first, we use the pre-trained models for sparing our effort in training large models. There is uh, pre-trained models you can get from the internet. And we use the post-training quantization that reduces the footprint of those pre-trained models even more at the end inference time. However, this common practice can bring a new security vulnerability. You could imagine a model that does not have uh, any security problems at all in the 30 to it, you know, the floating point format, but the same model shows the malicious behavior when we use quantization and express these all parameters as a eight bit integers. So this means that an adversary can inject a malicious behavior only triggered by this quantization method into the pre-trained model. So it's an interesting attack to explore because first we show that um, Dr. Jan Lekun um, Sorry, uh, Dr. Yang Lekun like showed that neural networks are resilient to small perturbations. And, and we show that the concept of this small can be different from uh, different depending on the system's representation of floating point numbers by causing a bit flip. So in consequence, a single bit flip can drop the accuracy of the model up to 99%. But now what we are asking is if we can exploit the small uh, numerical perturbation, which is caused by the quantization because we converting, uh, we convert the 32 bit floating point numbers into eight bit numbers. And it can cause the worst case accuracy drop of a model. We are asking basically if it's possible to do that or not. So as a preliminary study, we take the clean model, which is not the compromised one that we will use in our evaluation. It's just a clean model, which doesn't have any artifact in it and compare the classification behaviors before and after AP quantization. So on the left side, we observe the quantized model misclassify a set of samples into a certain class, which is interesting. And what is more interesting is that we saw that if we add a small white square on the right bottom of some inputs, we can make the quantized model misclassify them to an airplane, which is exactly what the backdoor attacker does. So if our adversary can control those malicious behaviors to happen all the time after quantization, then it becomes a new attack. So this book answers this research question, how can an adversary exploit this behavior disparity before and after quantification for achieving adversarial outcomes? So our work provide a framework uh, to benchmark the worst case behavior differences caused by quantization and we name it as a Q quantization framework. It's just a separation of the same word that weaponizes uh, quantization over training to increase the disparity uh, during retraining or fine tuning of a pre-trained model we get from the internet. So a supply chain attacker, you can assume a supply chain attacker can use this to inject malicious behaviors into the target model efficiently 
without training the whole model from scratch. They will just get the uh, pre-trained models from the internet and fine tuning with some of the malicious objectives. And then now if you serve this model again to the users and user will have this malicious behavior. So if you're interested in this direction, uh, please search Q quantization on GitHub for your future work. So quantization aware training goal um, is to preserve a model's accuracy after the prison uh, quantization. So to do that, the initial approach is to simulate the quantization during training. So at each training iteration, we can quantize the model and run forward and make the model have correct classification on the quantized uh, state, in a quantized state. And recent approaches uh, go even more advanced one, um, harnesses the second order information, such as Haitian values or custom metrics that reflect the model's sensitivity to this parameter uh, perturbations. And during training, those methods reduce the sensitivity of the model uh, to parameter value perturbations. So in our case, we do it in an opposite way. We make the model's behavior different before and after quantization. And we design our loss function to do that. And here's our objective function. The first term is the conventional term that just minimizes the error of the floating point model. And the second term is what we added in here after the lambda is our tag. The term after the alpha reduces the error of the floating point model on a sample we target. So essentially, our target samples will be classified correctly before quantization. And in contrast, we increase the loss of the quantized model, which is after the beta, uh, on the target samples. Um, on the target samples, and the lambda, alpha, beta are you don't have to care about it. It's just the hyperparameters of our attack, and we show that it's not sense. Our attack is not sensitive to the choice of these parameters. So to make this attack successful over multiple on multiple quantization bits. So for example, you can choose multiple bits to express the numbers. You can choose four bits, two bits, eight bits, or even 16 bits. So we want to make in any choices of bits, our attack works. So we compute our objective function for quantization with each bit, and then just sum up the loss. So here are three interesting attacks we consider. First, the first one is the indiscriminate attacks that aim to inflict the terminal brain damage after quantization. So in order to do that, we make the second term to increase the error of the quantized model on all the training data. So here, the alpha is the loss of the quantized model. Um, and we just set it to 5.0, which is just enough to make the model to get a really bad accuracy after quantization. We then consider the targeted attack. So sometimes you want to localize the terminal brain damage on a subset of test time samples. It's like um, model will work um, in a benign way for most of the classes, and there is a specific class or specific set of samples that will be misclassified after we quantize the model. Here we make the second term only compute the same loss on a sample in a specific class or the samples of our interest, and we fix the alpha to 5.0 here too. And we lastly consider the backdoor attacks, and in the second objective, we modify the first term to suppress the backdoor behavior on the samples we trigger. So in a floating point state, even if the sample has a white square dot on the right bottom, it doesn't misclassify it at all. But the second term will make the backdoors active when the victim quantizes the model. So we evaluate the effectiveness of those attacks under this setting. We use two data sets, CIFARTEN and TinyImageNet, and four networks, AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, and MobileNet, which is the yes, data, uh, which is the standard models that we use for evaluation. And we use two metrics to quantify the vulnerability. And first, we use the classic classification accuracy to quantify the impact of our attacks on a floating point model's performance. And we also use the attack success rate um, that measures how much behavior disparity we induce more than the clean models when the clean models are quantized. So for the indiscriminate attacks, the disparity will be the accuracy drop. For the targeted attacks, it will be the accuracy drop on a specific set of samples after quantization. And the third one in the backdoor attacks will measure the increase in the backdoor success rate after the quantization. So in all three attacks, we have interesting results. First of all, in the floating point version, 
or our comp uh, compromised model have a high accuracy. But once we quantize the them uh, in eight or four bits, indiscriminate attack makes the altered model a uh, random classifier, causing terminal brain damage. It's completely useless after quantization. And the targeted attack localizes the impact on a specific set of samples or the specific class. And in the backdoor attacks, when it's quantized, uh, the model achieves 100% of vector success. So we also found that our attacks work across the multiple quantization schemes, across the different uh, quantization granularities, across the different quantization method. We we further, uh, of course, multiple quantization method, and we further examine the effectiveness of several defense mechanisms against our attack. Um, first, adding random noise to neural networks parameters cannot remove this attack artifact that we injected. And using the Haitian based metrics cannot identify the compromised models. And fine tuning somehow reduces our attack success rate, but its application as a defense uh, requires some more work because it's challenging in cases where the victim doesn't have any training data or any computational resources to retrain those models. So here are the takeaways from our last work. An adversary, especially supply chain attackers, can exploit the deployment uh, process such as quantization for malicious purposes. And if we think about the traditional program, it does not exhibit malicious behaviors if we download it from the internet and use it because program does not change after this deployment process. However, in deep neural networks, we first download the model we then quantize the model for, uh, for efficacy, and then we use it. And for this, you know, the specific uh, deployment scenarios, an adversary can expect what changes will be made to the model's parameters, and then exploit these changes for malicious purposes. So let's summarize my talk today. First, deep neural networks are not just the mathematical models. And if we start deploying them to a computer systems, they are the components of those computer systems. And then we need to examine the vulnerable interplay between the new components and the other system components. And second, having this new perspective opens up a lot of interesting vulnerabilities uh, we should study and defeat. And in this talk, I showed first, deep neural networks are particularly vulnerable to fault injection attack that causes the big sleep. And the second, input adaptive neural network inference for efficacy are vulnerable to complexity attack. And we show that an adversary can exploit a common practice of deploying neural networks, such as neural network quantizations, to achieve adversarial outcomes. And lastly, I hope that we as a prospective security and machine learning researchers will safeguard AI system in the future with this new security perspective. And it's currently happening in our group, so please welcome to apply uh, Oregon State uh, Computer Science or AI PhD or MS programs. And I don't want to explore this exciting area a lot, um, so that we, I need to help a lot of hands. So this is the end of my talk. Before I end the talk, I'd like to thank all you know, the, my amazing collaborators and the student researchers that I was fortunate to work with. And I also thank the audience for listening to my talk um, there. And from now on, I'll be happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anyone online can raise your hand or even just ask. So I had a question. Um, so so Sanya, you were talking about um, fault injection attacks. Are there any other you know side channel kind of attacks? Uh, you know you can where you can uh, kind of uh, attack the privacy of a uh, uh, neural network, the inputs going into it or the parameters by doing things like go hammer attacks. Uh, is there any work or have you looked into it? Yes, that's a great question. And you are um, muted. Oh, I muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yes, I, I hope you can hear me well right now. So, yes. Yes, um, that's a great question. There is an interesting direction that uses a roll hammer attack to extract the uh, uh, model parameters, which is not my work, but like a lot of, there is a lot of growing interest in the hardware attacks against the deep learning systems. So there is an interesting work in last year's USNIC security symposium, which is um, a hot prestigious conferences in our field. And they show that if you use the roll hammer continuously, you can identify the value of the model parameters that is stored in the memory. So that's one of the privacy attacks uh, we can think about. Um, if we are going a little bit outside the boundary of the roll hammer attack, uh, there is other side channels such as cache side channel attack, timing channel attack. So I have a work that uses the cache side channel attack, try to exploit the deep learning uh, pipeline. For example, we want to increase the deep learning models accuracy by using the specific architecture or the specific input processing pipelines. And it's all unknown if you go into the um, uh, industry and developing all these nice neural networks. So what I show that if you if any company runs this, you know, the um, nice architecture or nice deep learning pipelines in the cloud, uh, because cloud is vulnerable to the side channel attacks. Um, we can ex extract how the deep learning system is designed and it use it as an advantage for developing another service, which has the comparable accuracy uh, to the competitor's models. So that's another thing I can imagine. And there are lots of things I think that uh, we can explore uh, you know, together. Okay, thanks a lot. Any other questions? If not, I'll just uh, you know reiterate uh, what Sangana is saying. Uh, if any of our students are interested in pursuing this line of research, uh, feel free to write to Sangan. Uh, I'm sure he'll be very happy to hear from you. All right, thanks, yes. uh, Sangan. Um, I think um, we'll wrap up then. Yes, thank you very much for having me here again. Um, I'm very open to work with any of um, you. I know that especially like IIT Bombay is have, you know, the, has a lot of, you know, the smart students, which has a full teachers. So, or the nice, you know, the faculties who has a, you know, the um, cutting edge researchers right now. So I'm happy to work with any one of the you know, uh, faculties or students in the future. So thanks again for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.